So uh, we are so fortunate to have this medical facility here uh, in the community. Um, and there's so many reasons uh, for that. The medical, uh, the history of medical services in this area is extraordinary. The growth that we've seen at this facility in particular uh, is amazing. Uh, but what makes it the most special are the people, right, and the care that uh, is given uh, to folks here, mostly uh, in need, tremendous need. So uh, just a round of applause for the Good Samaritan staff. And the We're going to hear from our hosts uh, in, a, in a little bit, uh, and especially our, their new president and CEO, Harrison Bain, who uh, has recently been appointed. Uh, he's going to talk with you. But before that, um, we, we will hear from our sponsors at Old Colony Elderly Services. We're very appreciative of them uh, sponsoring this breakfast this morning. Uh, they have been servicing uh, Greater Plymouth County for more than 44 years in providing uh, need, uh, help to people in need, and they're going to tell you a little bit about that. Finally, we're delighted to have with us uh, Tom Bassoni of Eastern Bank Wealth Management. Tom will present some economic analysis and uh, viewpoints from Eastern Bank and, and investments. He is speaking in place of Michael Tyler. Uh, Michael Tyler is the Chief Investment Officer, a Harvard graduate uh, and a resident of uh, Massachusetts. However, right now, he, uh, after sending his uh, presentation to us yesterday morning, he was informed his father-in-law was uh, gravely ill. And so he's actually in California right now. He caught a red eye last night, and he's attending to his family uh, emergency. So uh, our thought, thoughts and prayers are with him and his family. Um, and uh, we also are very appreciative of Tom stepping forward and presenting uh, Mike's uh, slides. They all work as a team, so we know. Won't ask you too many hard questions. <laughs> Before I introduce our MC this morning, allow me to introduce some new chamber staff faces. Uh, two weeks ago, we were joined by uh, Emma. Emma's uh, to the left. Uh, Emma Stratton. <laughs> Emma's a new communications person. Uh, she just recently completed her uh, requirements for a marketing degree and um, a graphic arts degree from Bridgewater State University. And uh, she's a Wareham resident and uh, joined us. And if you saw the February newsletter, which was out yesterday in the Enterprise newspaper, she did that in 10 days. So uh, hats off to you. <laughs> we also have with us uh, Kelly Thompson Clark. Uh, Kelly joins us. Uh, she started Monday. <coughs> Kelly has an extensive uh, history in chambers uh, spanning a couple decades, uh, starting in New Mexico, then in Philadelphia. Uh, then in, uh, uh, recently in Maryland, the state of Maryland, and uh, she spent 11 years as the chamber exec in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And she joins us to do development, strategic partnership, membership, and that type of thing. So Kelly, welcome. Uh, we expect <laughs> I also want to point out Doris Fletcher. Doris uh, is a retired um, volunteer with us. She's been with us eight years. <laughs> Does Yeoman's work for us, and uh, we wouldn't be the same without you, Doris, so thank you. It's been stressful the last couple of months that we had three <laughs> people leave uh, to chamber member employers, regional employers. Uh, so we, we have great staff, and we know that there's a worker shortage uh, because we're starting to feel it ourselves. Um, so most importantly, I want to remind you of Athena Lavoie. Athena is our director <laughs> of the program. And she and I have been the only people in the office the last uh, six or eight weeks uh, trying to keep everything going. So. Thank you, Athena, for all the extra effort uh, the last few weeks. So now it's my pleasure to introduce, and we are very fortunate to have his leadership, uh, Jerry Nadeau, uh, really needs no introduction. Uh, he's been a uh, uh, fixture in this community for many, many years, spanning back to grade school uh, in Brockton. Uh, and I know every now and then I'll be at an event and someone comes over to him and knows him from the old neighborhood uh, when they were 10 or 12 years old. And uh, so he knows the city like the back of his hand. And if you don't know that uh, Brockton, uh, people of Brockton have more money deposited in the Rockland Trust than any other financial institution in the city of Brockton. Um, the new president and CEO is uh, Jerry Nadeau, and he's also the chairman of our board. So, Jerry, sorry, I'm seeing. Good morning. The, um, I think the first order of business this morning is to um, recognize our ambassadors here today. And so hopefully I'm going to do this without uh, slaughtering anyone's name. So uh, Brenda Karens from OCS, 
Brian Hoffman in the Children's Museum in Easton, I think. Um, Richard Hook, Crescent Credit Union. Connie Hunt, United Way. John King, Series Inc. Catherine Light, Mansfield Bank. Rico McNeil, Bridgewater Savings. Joanne Schneider, Eastern Bank. I know Joanne's here. And Murray Vetstein, Source 4. So let's give a round of applause for all of them. Thank you. And then I think, do we have any um, elected officials? I think and we're going to. Beauregard, gonna City Council. And Beauregard, City Council, if we can stand and be recognized. Somewhere? And do we have from Brockton School Committee, uh, Mark D'Augustino, I think? There we go. Good morning. Um, I think our first order of business, we'd like to introduce Nicole Long, who will be interviewed by Richard Hook from Crescent Credit Union this morning. Uh, they, OCS, is our host this morning, so we need to thank them for this great breakfast, the full room we have, which is Old Colony Elder Services. The mission of Old Colony Elder Services is to support the independence and dignity of elders and individuals with disabilities by providing them essential information and services that promote safe, healthy living. Joining us today from OCS is Chief Executive Officer Nicole Long. As CEO, Nicole's primary focus is to maintain and grow both community and funding relationships. Ms. Long began her career at OCS in 2005 in the Family Caregiver Support Program. She was appointed Existent Executive Director in 2015, working alongside Diana DiGiorgi. DiGiorgi, thank you. Nicole holds a Master of Social Work from Bridgewater State University and is a licensed independent clinical social worker. She also serves as a commissioner on the Board of Directors for the Plymouth Housing Authority and is an equine facilitated psychotherapist at Wild Hearts Therapeutic Equestrian Program in West Bridgewater. That's very interesting. Please welcome Nicole, who will be interviewed this morning by Richard Hook from Crescent Credit Union. This morning and sponsor this event. How are you feeling? I'm feeling very good. Good. Actually. good, good. <laughs> so, uh, what's what's the one assumption that people make about OCS that, that's not quite correct? Well, I think uh, our name can be misleading. Old Colony Elder Services, and with that, people assume that we serve only. Um, elderly individuals or people who are 60 and older and we serve people of all ages so yes our mission is to support um, elderly and individuals with disabilities but we also support caregivers we support employers we really offer a wide array of services to meet everybody's needs including a very um, robust information referral department. We're part of two aging and disability resource consortiums and because of that we partner with local independent living centers, other aging service access points, and because of that and because of our other relationships we have a no wrong door philosophy. So if anybody has a need we can meet it either directly through our services or through connecting people to an organization in the community. Last year alone, we served over 22,000 people, 22,500 people. So we have three offices and over 240 employees. So I'm proud to say we're very creative and innovative in the programs and services that we can offer to meet a wide variety of needs. Great, great, great. So, uh, so Nicole, tell us about OCS and, and supports with people with dementia and uh, cognitive disorders. Tell us about it. So one of our programs is the Family Caregiver Support Program. And again, that's a program where we serve people of all ages in a variety of ways. We also serve a lot of employers in that program. Oftentimes, we get calls from local EAP programs trying to figure out what resources to offer caregivers. So for everyone in this room, you can call us directly, and we can come to your office to provide training, support, 
but we work with individuals one on one, and a lot of our consumers are caring for somebody that has some sort of memory impairment. So, in addition, in addition to the free personalized care planning and resources that we provide, we have a program called Music and Memory, and it's very exciting because we have received funds that we've been able to purchase iPods, headphones, speakers, and we're able to work with the family to upload a customized playlist onto the iPod that is specifically tailored to the interest and the memories of the person with the memory impairment. It's completely free, and it's amazing the joy and the relief that hearing those songs has brought to the individual with the memory impairment, whether it's Alzheimer's, dementia, um, mild cognitive disorders. And the caregiver has that break. They don't have to be you know, on for that moment where their loved one can listen to the music, and they can just hear the joy and the pleasure, the relaxation that that music brings them. So that's one program that we offer that's very creative and I think a lot of fun. Our staff and volunteers get to get out in the community, upload the music, and just connect with people in a different way. You know, I, I'm blessed with uh, my parents, 85, 86, and they've had their, their times. And uh, I've reached out to your offices and they've been very, very helpful. So it's just great to have you on. It, it really is good. Uh, so in all of us at one time, we're going to have a transition from the hospital stay, the nursing home, uh, rehab, back to home. Where does OCS feel in there? How, how can they help? We're really proud to offer uh, care transition support. We have transition support advi advisors as well as options counselors. And uh, those employees, they're able to meet with the family either in the hospital or in a nursing home or in a rehab, um, work with the hospital or rehab or nursing home staff to really explain what to expect with the transition home or to talk about their options to prevent um, an unnecessary nursing or rehab stay. We're able to look at all the resources that Oak Colony provides as well as the resources in the community and really put together a tailored plan so that person can transition home when they want, as soon as they want, and we can have everything in place. So we currently are working on a pilot project to have home care services or VNA services start the day that we receive a call of a discharge. So we like to get advance notice, but sometimes you get the call that this person's gonna be able to go home tomorrow, and we can activate a wide network right away to try to get those services in place. So that's something we're really proud of, and we're always looking to expand our partnerships. So we'd love to do work here um, and expand that opportunity. So. I think that's really important for people to know. It's not just about the services, it's about the information and coordinating the information and making it accessible. Thank you. Uh, so do you have any suggestions on how people in this room can get involved and be more proactive uh, uh, and informed <laughs> how we can partner with OCS to support adults and people with disabilities? Well, we have a very robust volunteer program. Brenda Karens, the Chamber Ambassador, she oversees our volunteer program. And we have a wide array of volunteer opportunities in the community as well as opportunities to support Old Colony. Anyone of any age can uh, work with us on that. Um, even delivering meals on wheels one day a month. Uh, we serve 1,600 meals a day. Um, and we have a, right, a wide uh, service area, Avon, Stoughton, and Easton, all the way down to Wareham. So we're always looking for support in that area. We do a lot of fundraising, so there's a lot of sponsorship opportunities, individual donations. We have an upcoming 5K to support our Meals on Wheels program. That's April 29th. So again, we're looking for sponsorships. We're looking for runners. It's a fun event right out um, in Kingston. And we also offer protective services. So we, we, we need the community to support us in identifying situations that um, need to be addressed, whether it's self-neglect, um, caregiver neglect, abuse. Uh, we, we provide a lot of services around that. So if you see something or if you're just concerned with something, give us a call. And um, all of this information is on our website, ocesma.org. So I encourage everybody to take a look and you can see some more information about those uh, opportunities. Thank you, Nicole. And thank you for all you do uh, and your staff. We've got uh, Lynn Woods, Lynn, Lynn, Lynn Brenda. Okay.
fantastic. Thank you. Really great. Uh, it is good to know this. And we had a conversation yesterday that it, it, it's so important to know that there are people that sit in these positions that really care. They really care. They're not just there for, for pay uh, or status. They really, really care. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you for coming. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Again, thank both Nicole and Richard this morning. It was very informative. Thank you. The, today, we also want to thank our host, Good Samaritan Medical Center, a Stewart family hospital. Joining us today from Good Samaritan is the hospital's new president, Harrison Bain. Harry Bain, I think you prefer Harry, so I'm going to be less formal. You're welcome. Since I was born with the name Gerard, and I prefer Jerry, I do understand. <laughs> Harry rejoined the Good Samaritan Medical Center leadership team as president on January 4th, 2018. Harry previously held the position as Vice President of Operations at Good Samaritan while he built a culture of collaboration. Before serving at Good Samaritan, Harry was an Associate Administrator at St. Elizabeth's Medical Center, also a Stewart Family Hospital, I believe in Brighton. In his most recent senior role at Bain Care, Harry led the system-wide integration of healthcare delivery and value-based care for the 13 skilled nursing and rehabilitation facilities, adult day health centers, and assisted living facilities. And before I introduce Harry, so I'll tell you, as Chris mentioned, I have a history to the city of Brockton. So my mother was among the first 10 patients admitted to this hospital that was built. And she was very, very sick at the time, and she lived another 40 years. So thank you. <laughs> and more recently, my... I'm sorry? <laughs> I know. I do understand that. So you can't quite take that. However, um, <laughs> Both my youngest two grandchildren were born here, and they're very happy, healthy children, so thank you. So, Karen? Thank you for that introduction, and um, thank you all for being here. Before I get into uh, my formal remarks, I do want to thank uh, OCES for uh, partnering with us on this event, as well as the Chamber. Um, and certainly want to recognize our marketing communications teams, Kim, Nikki, as well as the uh, EVS and support staff for putting this all together. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Um, it's great to be back uh, in uh, the city of Brockton, in the uh, Metro South world, and at Good Samaritan Medical Center. Uh, this opportunity, this was not part of my plan coming back to Good Um I did work in the Stewart family system for four years uh, prior to joining my family's organization, and I was third generation. Uh, my father, a second generation grandfather, started the business in 1959 in Lynn, uh, predominantly a North Shore family. And as Jerry commented, had an opportunity to uh, grow the business into the South Shore. And uh, dad at the time said, you know, can't do this alone anymore. I'm the CEO, CFO, COO, head of HR, everything but the nurse, pretty much. And uh, he said, if I'm gonna do this, I need some help. So went over, supported him over a two year period, and my plan was to grow uh, our family's business into a third generation. Uh, but this opportunity presented itself. Um, and at this point in my life, it, it made sense to join a community I was familiar with, uh, a medical staff who is uh, really world class, and a community uh, to the point that Rick and Nicole were talking about, a community and a hospital that really cares about its mission and its vision uh, of serving the local communities uh, that we surround ourselves with. So all of that matched up that I had familiarity, and I said, you know what, let's, let's jump back in. I'm a month into to my tenure, and I'm thrilled with the decision. Uh, the community has uh, embraced um, me, and, and I'm grateful and fortunate for that. So let me uh, tell you a little bit about Good Sam um, and some of the investments that we've made uh, over the last several years in transitioning from uh, Caritas to Steward and that 50th uh, anniversary I'm going to get to. We are in our 50th anniversary, for those who don't know. We've been trying to uh, advertise in uh, the enterprise, on social media, on all the various platforms, but uh, this past month, January 13th, of 2018 was Good Sam's 50th birthday. Now, for those who have been in the community for all 50 of those years, you'll remember that Cardinal Cushing dedicated the hospital, and there was Cardinal Cushing and the Goddard that came together. So uh, 
it, it, as some folks mentioned, that it's really the 25th anniversary, but we're, we're celebrating the Cardinal Cushing uh, dedication and the Good Samaritan dedication uh, uh, for its 50th anniversary this year. And we had a kickoff event with a wonderful 3D celebration of a cake with staff coming down, and there was a before and after picture of the cake that went in, in about two hours. And then uh, two Sundays ago, we had uh, His Eminence Cardinal Sean O'Malley come and uh, deliver Mass uh, 50 years later to the day that uh, Cardinal Cushing uh, himself dedicated the, the hospital. So, um, so good Sam, these four pictures uh, on the top left, it's our main campus, on the top right is our uh, w uh, a highlighting of our Women's Health Center with uh, 3D tomosynthesis, which is the state of the, tech state of the art technology in delivering uh, mammography services. Our same day surgery center uh, in the bottom left and our uh, uh, new emergency room from 2013 built from scratch, uh, $30 million investment, which uh, candidly is, a, is, I live in Boston, so commute south, is this, uh, this emergency room competes with all the top, all the top EDs out there. Um, we have 2,000 employees at Good Sam, 625 on the medical staff, uh, 600 of those staff being RNs, 267 licensed beds with a 16 uh, bed dedicated for behavioral health, Jerry Psych unit on our fourth floor. Uh, a part of those 267 beds, we also have 43 beds at an offsite location called NORCAP, which is a residential substance abuse program, uh, inpatient and outpatient. Uh, as I said, our emergency room is a focal point of our organization. We do approximately 65,000 visits uh, a year. For those who have been following uh, and reading the paper or, or stat news or other or various sources where you get your health information, this season's flu has been particularly challenging <coughs> and particularly dangerous. Uh, as a result of that, we've seen uh, emergency room volume uh, actually last Monday, the highest on record. Our patient care director has been here for 38 years and she came to me and said, last Monday with 256 visits in a 24 hour period was the most we've ever had in the history of Good Sam. So that just gives you the type of volume and, and really severity of the uh, flu out there. So please, uh, hand washing, hand washing, hand washing. It's, the, it's really the best thing you can do. Uh, 17,000 discharges. In, uh, in the hospital, 25,000 procedures, both on the inpatient and outpatient side. Uh, we're the largest taxpayer in the city of Brockton, which is, is an important uh, note to, to show. Not only do we uh, invest in the services, but we invest in uh, the community. Uh, with the 2.5 million, as well as our community, community benefits, 5 million working with groups like OCES, working with groups like the Chamber, working with other nonprofits and health institutions across all of Greater Brockton. Uh, we're really passionate and committed to making sure that we serve the communities uh, that, we, that we take care of. Some key services. Uh, last year, this was a two-year journey that just completed last year. We became the first and only designated level three trauma center in region five. Region five is uh, the 24 corridor south down to the Cape. And, and that's a huge accomplishment for this organization and this, uh, this institution. The idea behind it is, uh, you know, Stewart's whole concept and Good Sam's whole concept is keeping care local, not having to go into downtown, not having to go for specialty services or, or even basic services. You want to be able to keep care local. This, this level three trauma designation gives us the ability to take care of some more complex and specialty services that otherwise would go down Route 24 right into downtown Boston. We're really proud of that. We have a great medical director who's completely committed. I've never seen him. Uh, Rick, Dr. Rick Paulson, who may have, uh, he's been in the community for a long, long time, is totally committed to this program and making sure it's successful and sustainable in the future. Um, it's something that when I was here in my previous role as Vice President of Operations that we started and to see it come to fruition uh, was remarkable. Cardiology services, including uh, an interve interventional cardi cardi Cardi, uh, cardiology room. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? And um, uh, as you as you heard, thank you for uh, the shout out for Heart Month. Uh, Cliff Berger was he is uh, on Valentine's Day offering a service. He's uh, the chief of the uh, cardiac cath lab, 
cath lab here does a fantastic job. So uh, if you have time, please come join us for that. Uh, cancer, cancer care program, inc including radiation oncology, which is right on campus uh, in our backyard here, led by Dr. Jason Zalls. Uh, a comprehensive diagnostic imaging center, the emergency department I've highlighted. Uh, a wound care center, which is uh, over in Stoughton with hyperbaric chambers, which is the state-of-the-art technology <laughs> to really treat some complex wounds. <coughs> wounds can get, from not only my hospital experience, but in my skilled nursing and assisted living experience, wounds can get pretty, um, pretty dicey pretty quickly, and this type of treatment and, and uh, <coughs> service is, is, the, is the technology that can get it healed uh, relatively quickly. Our orthopedic center of excellence is something that uh, we've accomplished uh, in, in the last 12 months. Um, this was a two-year journey that also started in 2015. Uh, it's a designation by the Joint Commission, which is the uh, governing body that accreditates us, that gives us deeming status through the uh, CMS. Um, it's a great program that took a multidisciplinary approach with nursing, surgeons, uh, skilled nursing facilities, patients, families, the entire community on making sure uh, it's right care, right place, right time for our orthopedic um, uh, program. Uh, OBGYN, we have a wonderful program here. We deliver uh, 12, roughly 1,200 babies a year. I have a personal, uh, I, I see what goes on there now and have a totally different lens. I'm a new father, six months old, baby George. And going up on that unit now, I have a, it, it's God's work, it's a miracle. It's literally every single day we do four or five deliveries and it's miracle work <laughs> that gets done there every day and um, it's, it's special. Um, behavioral health and geriatrics, I talked about our 4BH program in NorCap Lodge. So as you can see, we have a, a, a robust uh, amount of service and offerings that we're proud to be able to say uh, we're, we're serving the communities that we're in, which leads me into, I'm going to skip over that slide. Some of the awards and accreditations that we talked about, the only, uh, the Level 3 Trauma Center, the Joint Commission, uh, Gold Star through the, uh, the program that I just talked about, the cancer accreditation, the lung screening program through our radiation oncology and our baby friendly. Not to only do we deliver the services that I just talked about, but we, uh, we highlight and we compete uh, amongst the best in our national benchmark uh, standards and partners uh, demonstrate, uh, demonstrate that here today. So talking about the primary service area, you can see um, the yellow boxes are our primary service area, meaning that's where most of the patients from, uh, who come to Good Sam live and reside. The blue is our secondary service area, which is where our secondary, second most amount of patients come from uh, on a daily basis. Uh, makes a lot of sense. You can see that immediately surrounding Brockton, Easton, Stoughton, Randolph, the Bridgewaters, East and West, Abington, uh, and Holbrook. Don't want to forget Whitman in there. And then certainly uh, you can see the blue on the outside. Uh, we also have our partners with Compass Medical in East Bridgewater, NorCap Lodge I highlighted, uh, which is in Foxborough. So that's not in either one of our primary or secondary service areas, but it's a still a key piece to what we do here every single day. Um, and then the Goddard campus is in blue in Stoughton, uh, which is where our wound center is. Uh, and where the uh, Northeastern Surgery Center, which is where our outpatient, a lot of our outpatient procedures happen, uh, and our orthopedic team uh, sits. We have some uh, primary care offices there, which I'm sure many of you uh, actually use. Any questions I can answer uh, about anything I've discussed so far? Okay. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Steward. Um, first, the Massachusetts footprint. Steward has uh, nine hospitals in Massachusetts that really range from the uh, northernmost part of, New of Massachusetts and the southernmost part of Massachusetts, east of uh, 495. So it's really eastern region of Massachusetts. Holy Family uh, is in the Methuen Haverhill Market. St. Anne's is down in the uh, Fall River Market. And then as you work your way up, Morton and Taunton, you go up 24. Good Sam uh, is right above Morton. And I'm going to go off <coughs> mic here for a second. But this is why Good Sam can be, and we are striving to be, the premier regional choice. Because as you see, this 24 quarter, there, there's, there's, there's this gap here. 
That's why this trauma designation was so important to us because, and so important to the community because you don't need to bypass Good Sam anymore for traumatic type services, for <coughs> intensive care services, for trauma, for surgical services. Formally, everybody, the EMS providers would go right up into downtown Boston because there wasn't that sort of uh, level of service and, and frankly, credibility that the, that the uh, market could have. So it was a great two-year journey, and I, I just want to make sure I highlight that. Um, Kearney Hospital, St. Elizabeth's, uh, which is the flagship in the organization. We, we call ourselves a good Sam, the flagship of the organization, and I won't tell our partners at St. Elizabeth's that. We are busier than St. Elizabeth's. Um, and then uh, Neshoba Valley out in here. As you may be familiar, Stewart has grown very rapidly over the last uh, 12 months. First, in a central region, and that's in the yellow box there. Uh, they made an acquisition uh, as through HMA with uh, some hospitals in Pennsylvania and Florida. And then most recently, in October of 2017, the West Division was created with facilities out in Texas, Arizona, Colorado, Utah, um, and uh, Louisiana. So Stewart is now the largest privately held um, hospital operator in the country. And it's commitments to, and really it's a reflection of the, the Massachusetts model working. It's, a, it's the Massachusetts model that uh, they've built this accountable care with the Stewart Healthcare Network, with Stewart Medical Group, and with the hospital division. There are three different divisions within Stewart Healthcare, and it's that the original platform of accountable care with the nine hospitals or the six hospitals that became nine hospitals in Massachusetts that has demonstrated proof of concept for them to be able to grow and us be able to grow um, into different parts of the country. So I talked a little bit about the 50 year celebration here at Good Sam. Uh, we have events planned throughout the year. We started our, uh, with a great kickoff event to celebrate with our staff, our physicians, our community members, uh, our board members. Uh, on January 13th, we had Cardinal Sean O'Malley uh, at uh, two Sundays ago, and we have plans uh, every month uh, to celebrate and recognize different parts of the community, whether that's staff, physicians, community members, community partners, um, to, to engage in, and recognize this 50 years of providing great healthcare services uh, to the greater Brockton community. It coincides nicely with my arrival. I'm thrilled to be a part of this community. Um, please, our doors are open. My door is open to all of you uh, because I was raised in a family business and if you don't provide good care for as if they were your own loved one, nothing else matters. So that's, that's kind of our philosophy here and, and our platform moving forward. And um, thank you all for being here today. And, uh, and uh, I wish you all a, a, a good uh, uh, February and beyond. Thank you very much, Harry. It's a great accomplishment to hear a history of a 50-year organization, institution, really, like Common Cushing Good Sam. So thank you. Let me just move a few things around here, if I may. And again, as Chris introduced earlier in our introduction, uh, Michael Tyler was not able to join us today, but we are very fortunate to have Tom Busoni, I'll make sure I'm saying this right, who's Vice President and Fixed Income Strategist uh, for Eastern Bank Wealth Management. Um, he, Tom works to support Michael, so and I think Michael has put together a presentation for us today that Tom is going to show very capably share with us. Um, Michael and Tom work on setting investment policy and structure asset allocation strategies for client portfolios. As the primary spokesman for the firm's investment services, Michael develops and disseminates, interesting, economic and financial market viewpoints. And with that, Tom. And by the way, before I introduce Tom, maybe just so I don't forget, each of you have on your table some green pieces of paper, and if you would be so kind, if you have something you're interested in learning about, then of course, maybe 40, 50 questions, Tom, would be okay. <laughs> so if you, if you do have something you're interested in, please write it down and someone will come around and pick them up. So, thank you. Good morning, everybody. 
it is great to be here. Uh, Michael Tyler is sorry that he, you know, couldn't make it today. Uh, however, he did have time to put together a rather, a rather large, large packet. Um, so due to timing, and I do want to leave some time for questions, I am going to bypass a couple of the, uh, the slides going forward. So I do want to begin on slide um, page number three, just to talk a little bit about uh, Eastern Bank and who we are. So Eastern Bank is one of the largest and oldest mutual banks in the United States. Uh, we employ about 1,900 individuals and we have about 100 branches. Uh, we are the number one SBA lender in New England uh, for the past seven years. Now I am a member of Eastern Bank Wealth Management, a member of the investment team. Uh, there's about 50 individuals in the division. Uh, we do manage about just over 2.2 billion in assets. Uh, we have about 1.4 billion in equities and the remaining balance is in fixed income. So the first slide I'd like to discuss regarding the economy is on slide four. So it's the GDP components. So basically GDP is made up of three different uh, components. It's consumption, investment, and government. So the consumption is really consumer spending. And consumer spending is very important to the economy because it basically represents about 70% um, of GDP. So when the consumers are spending, it's usually a positive thing for the economy as well as the stock market and so forth. However, if you look on this graph, you can see the, the red line, which is the investment aspect of it. And that is basically corporations who are spending. So whether it's their building inventories, whether they're purchasing um, new equipment or they're building new structures, you can see that actually did take a little spike during 2017. Now that is very positive because that sort of indicates that there is global growth. For the first time in many years, you are seeing that we're having global um, growth throughout, all, not just the U.S., but throughout the economy, whether it be uh, Europe, emerging markets, and so forth. So we do expect this to continue uh, heading into this year. Obviously, with the tax cuts, that's going to be a big benefit. There has been a lot of talk that the companies and corporations are just going to buy back shares and increase their dividends. However, we do think that they will, um, at least over the next year or so, you know, reinvest um, the, the money uh, that they're saving into the business. So we do believe that the GDP can continue to grow around two, two and a half percent, at least over the next year or so. So the next slide is uh, leading indicators on page five. So the leading indicators basically predicts future and economic activity. You can see it has been growing between one and two percent uh, for the past, you know, four or five years. So this is very positive. This sort of indicates that businesses are doing really well. The index is made up of 10 different components, uh, just a couple of them being um, working hours, building permits, and consumer sentiment. So the 10 components, the majority of them are moving in the right direction. So this is something we continuously follow. Uh, the next slide is consumer price index. And this is interesting because you would think since the economy has been growing for so long, uh, th that there would be some inflation, and you just haven't been seeing that. The Federal Reserve's on record basically acknowledging that they do like to have 2% of inflation. <laughs> it is good for the economy. If they don't have their prices continue to decline, or they stay flat, and what that, ha what that does is that means consumers usually take a pause in spending. Because if they think prices are going to move lower, they'll probably wait, and then they can get a better deal, and then that hampers growth. So we do think inflation is uh, understated. Um, however, it is something to keep an eye on. You can see it did just recently spike, uh, but we do need to see that between two, two and a half percent, and that would be very positive. Um, the next slide is uh, the price of oil. And now the reason why we, uh, Michael put this in the presentation is this sort of gives an indication of what the global growth and the global economy is doing. You can see it bottomed in 2016, and it has come up, it's about $65 a barrel. Uh, we actually think that this is healthy. It's not really, you know, it wasn't too good. People were panicking when it was around $25, $30. Uh, a lot of industrial companies and oil and energy companies, they were having issues servicing their debt and so forth. Also, you see gas below $3. It's around $250 to $3. Uh, that's not bad for the consumer. So it's sort of a win-win for the consumer as well as some of the corporations. So the one thing that's really driving this, at least over the past, you know, six months to a year, is you're actually seeing a pickup in demand. So it's just not energy companies that uh, are drilling it. This is actually a demand pickup, and U.S. stockpiles have actually been declining. So we view that as just another sign that the global economy is doing well. 
And this is basically the theme that Michael has sort of created throughout this packet, is we are optimistic about the economy, we are optimistic about the uh, equity markets. And I'll discuss those you know, points a little bit further. Uh, the next slide is uh, mortgage rates in the home price index. The thing to focus on in the mortgage rates is it's great that the mortgage rates are 4% or lower for it seems like the past you know, four or five years. That was great for house prices. Um, however, the one thing you have to be aware of is if, if the mortgage rates do rise uh, to like 5%, that could really uh, hurt the housing market. It's great when people are buying and selling houses because what happens when you go into a new house, you usually buy furniture, you do paint, you have to do you know, a little construction, and that's more money flowing into the economy. So we think if you get to around 5 5.5%, housing could really get cut off and people will sort of stay put where they are, and that will have an absolute impact um, going forward. But we're not seeing that yet. So the next slide, this is very important, it's uh, average hourly wage. You can see it actually has been increasing uh, for quite some time, and that's very positive. As I mentioned, consumer consumption is 70% uh, of the economy, and if people are making more money, what do they typically do? They're going to spend. So you can see that uh, trending higher, and that's something um, that we're constantly uh, focused on. That means that you know, if wages are going up, households are usually happier, people are, um, are spending more, they're taking vacations, and that just filters uh, right through to the overall economy. So page 10 is a weekless jobless claim, and this sort of supports the slide on the previous page. Uh, basically, we're at full employment. The unemployment rate's right about 4, 4.1%. And by having um, a tight uh, labor market, that's going to be good for wages. If there's not a lot of people to fill the openings, that means people you know, can ask for more money. And in many times, of course, the companies are going to have to you know, pay up to keep them or pay up to you know, get them in, into a new spot. So you can see that is really at a, a low since 1990. Uh, it's been that way for the past year. And we don't really expect this uh, too much to change. And this also should factor into the inflation graph that we showed. If the wages are going up and there's you know, jobs um, up are not, uh, difficult to fill, wages are going up, and then that should lead to higher inflation. So like I said, the inflation rate's about 2% right now. If it goes to 25 that's not necessarily a bad thing. But anything higher, 3 3.5%, the Federal Reserve could get a, a little concerned. So this is where I'm actually going to skip around uh, just real quick. Um, if anyone has some questions regarding the slides I jumped over, um, you know, we can discuss after. Um, page 18 is the Treasury uh, yield curve. So the Treasury yields have been down for, uh, seems like forever. Uh, the 30 year is basically at 3%, the 2 year, tr the 10 year Treasury is at 2 and 3 quarters. And this is the direct result of the Federal Reserve buying bonds. This was very beneficial because by you know lowering uh, interest rates, you could see the mortgage rates drop, so that certainly helped the um, the housing market. Also, corporations could refinance their debt, so they were paying five, six, seven percent on the debt. They could refi at lower rates, so that helped um, corporations as well. Also, households, if they needed to borrow money with lower interest rates, they uh, could borrow at cheaper costs. So this was all part of the Federal Reserve's idea when they were buying bonds during QE1, QE2, and QE3. They wanted to suppress interest rates to stimulate economic growth. And they certainly did that. However, I don't think they planned on you know, rates being where they are for so long. At some point, they do need to normalize, and we just haven't seen that yet. So another um, benefit, actually, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so the Federal Reserve dot plot. So as I mentioned, the, the Fed um, has suppressed interest rates. Now at some point they have to normalize. So this is basically telling you that the Fed has acknowledged that they're going to raise the federal funds rate uh, three times this year. So what that sort of in a typical environment means interest rates are going to go higher. Now the reason why everyone focuses on this is because if interest rates go too high, that could cut off some of the economic expansion. Like I said, it goes back to borrowing costs, it goes back to corporations um, issuing new debt and so forth. So people focus on this because if the Federal Reserve gets aggressive, it really could hurt GDP and then obviously that's going to rotate into the equities and there could be a little bit of problems. So most people are okay with the 2018, the three, uh, the three hikes. It's 2019 that people are focusing on. You can really see that the dot plot is really scattered. Some people are expecting at least three or four more hikes, so the interest rate would get to three to three and a half. That would certainly get the mortgage rates probably to, you know, up over five. And that, you know, would hurt a lot of pocketbooks. 
And once again, it would, you know, it would hurt consumer spending. On page 20, I'm sorry, I have to skip my graphs. So page 20 is government uh, debt yields um, around the globe. And this is what's uh, pretty interesting, at least some of us find it interesting. <laughs> so uh, our, government, our government debt, which is really the highest quality, you know, globally it's AA, AAA, depending on who you talk to, whether it's S&P and Moody's. And even though we're like the highest quality, our 10-year treasury is yielding more than other countries like Italy, Spain, and Germany, and so forth. So this is part of the reason also why our interest rates remain so low. So if you could buy our high quality 10 year paper yielding about 250, why would you buy Germany's yielding about 0.66? Also, why would you buy um, Italy's paper yielding pretty much the same and it's much lower quality, they're having a lot more issues. So this is something that's actually worked out for the Fed because it sort of put a cap on our yields. However, when these yields start to go higher overseas, we expect ours will trend higher as well. There's a big gap between our yields and other countries' yields. It's about 2%. And if you look back in history, that is, you know, really a wide margin. So this, is, so this has been, like I said, uh, it's interesting to follow to see how this plays <coughs> out. And also, what is pretty amazing, as you can see below, you can see Germany and Switzerland. Uh, their bonds are actually yielding negative. So it's basically you're giving the government um, of Germany and Switzerland money and you're losing, you know, because it's a negative interest rate. And it just sort of, has, sort of shows how uh, distorted the, the treasury markets are in all debt markets. And that's because of the ECB continues to buy bonds, the uh, Federal Reserve, you know, they did their three rounds of uh, quantitative easing. Um, so at some point, we believe that the debt markets need to be monitored because they could be, you know, what takes down the stock market. Because at some point, the debt markets have to basically reprice, they need to reset, and they have to go back to normalization. So the yield curve. So the yield curve is basically the spread between uh, two-year Treasury note yields and the 10-year Treasury note yields. This is something that I focus on basically every day. Uh, basically, this indicates that seven times um, that the yield curve has inverted, meaning the yield on the long bond, the 10-year treasury, um, is yielding less than two-year treasury. So you can give the government um, your money, they'll pay you a higher interest for two, um, two years instead of 10. And like I said, this is important because it preceded the past seven investments. So when the curve has inverted, um, following that, the, there has been a recession. And just when the curve reverts, it doesn't mean you need to sell stocks. It doesn't mean that a recession is right around the corner. You do have some time, but this is a red flashing sign saying that there are some issues uh, with the economy. Because basically what's happening in is, is investors are uh, purchasing long dated treasuries for safety, even though it's yielding a lot less than treasuries on the front end of the curve. So that is, uh, that is very concerning, and like I said, it's been a great indicator of the past uh, for prior recessions. Uh, regarding the Federal Reserve, um, this is their balance sheet. Their goal was to suppress interest rates, and they certainly did it, and they're still um, you know, pretty low versus history, if you look at uh, the long-term graphs. What's interesting is the Federal Reserve's balance sheet was about $800 billion before they did the QE, the QE1 and 2 and 3. And right now, it's currently about five trillion. So they've had a huge impact in the market. Basically, they've been the biggest buyer of U.S. Treasuries. That's why yields are low. And the issue is, when they stop buying, what's going to happen? Who's going to fill their spot? And that's what I think the Fed and many investors are worried about. Because if yields spike, like I already mentioned, that's going to hurt the economy, and it leads to a lot of uncertainty and, and, and it's the lack of stability. What people are worried about. The Fed has never had a balance sheet this big, so no one really knows the impact. They are beginning to draw down their holdings, and this is something that everyone's watching uh, closely. So this is the Fed security holdings uh, projections. As I say, they're basically uh, rolling off about $10 billion, um, a month, but they are reinvesting the securities that mature, at least the majority of them. But what's interesting is the balance sheet, like I mentioned, it was $800 billion before they started buying bonds. It's currently you know, 4.5, and just in 2021, it will go to about 3,500. But before the whole credit crisis, back in 2008 and 2009, it was only at 800, 800 uh, billion. So, I'm sorry, yeah, 800 million. So the the problem is, is that they are impacting um, 
the market in such a big way. So some people can make the case that it's really not a free market because they're just the biggest player. Um, so some people haven't been too happy that they, they have been involved as much as they have. The, the Fed has been dealing uh, with securities and purchases for like the last five or six years. I don't think they really had any intention of you know, doing it for that long. Um, however, unfortunately, just due to market conditions, they feel like they need to be a major player. Um, so now, so that's enough with uh, fixed income and bonds and now to the important stocks, uh, stocks versus bonds. So the S&P uh, 500 yield versus the 10-year Treasury yield. You can see in the past that the 10-year Treasury yield, you know, was typically always yielding a lot greater than what the stocks were yielding. But when the, the Federal Reserve, you know, was a player in the market, you can see that the yields have dropped quite a bit. So that's another reason why equities have performed so well during the past, you know, three or four years. Because if you can get 2% um, in a 10-year treasury, which is, you know, 2% a year for 10 years is not good, and you have interest rate risk, why wouldn't you purchase stocks that are yielding more than the 10-year treasury? For example, you can buy like AT&T yielding 5%, but you can buy a two-year treasury yielding 10. The numbers don't really work. So it is good that people um, were, you know, that the market's gone up, but part of it is people were forced to invest in equities because they needed another source of income. And that means, you know, people are doing a little bit more, they're adding risk to their portfolios. And it has worked for the past four or five years, but at some point that's something people got to be considered. Maybe they're too overweight stocks, maybe they're in too much dividend stocks and so forth. So the bond market has led to, uh, to money flowing into riskier assets such as uh, equities. So this is the impact of changes. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's very difficult to see what happens if interest rates rise. And we believe that interest rate risk is really one of the biggest risks uh, out there. So if you basically, <coughs> if you buy a two-year or two-year treasury note yield, so a two-year treasury bond, um, you can hold it for two years and you can collect your coupon and so forth. But during that time, if interest rates go up 1%, you can see a two-year note barely, the price on the two-year note barely declines. However, if you purchase a 10-year note and interest rates go up just 1%, that bond is going to go down 10%. And if you uh, purchase a 30-year bond and yields go up 1%, your price of your bond is going to go down 20%. So yields have just gone down, it seems, for like 30 straight years. So we think people are really underestimating um, the situation with yields and if interest rates do go higher. And if you do look, if, if bonds uh, yield so-called normalize and say there's a 3% move, and that's really not far-fetched. The 30-year, there's no problem with it, you know, being right around 5 or 6%. Your long bond would almost uh, decline around 50%. So there is a lot of interest rate risk. And when we have our portfolios, we're focusing on the front end of the curve. We're only going out four, five, or six years. We're very well diversified. We're more of a buy and hold. So we're minimizing the interest rate risk because this is something we really are concerned about. So page 26, this is actually some good and bad we got in the high yield bonds. So the good portion of this is high yield is lower quality uh, credit. So you want to be compensated for owning risk. So if you buy a high yield bond, typically you want five or 6% more than if you buy the safety of a treasury. But people have been searching for yield for, it seems like, four or five years now. And you can see that the spreads have collapsed. So if you buy a lower quality bond, you're only going to get three, three and a half percent. We think you should be getting five or six. But this is telling you that, you know, investors think the credit markets are good, companies' balance sheets are very great, that the economy is going to continue to grow, and they shouldn't have, you know, any issues meeting the debt payments. But on the other side, we don't think you're being fairly compensated. So if spreads open up, meaning the yields, getting what you get compensated over treasuries goes to four or five percent, the price of your bond is going to go down. So if you're getting five or six percent over treasuries, we think you're getting rewarded for the risk, but anything less than four or five, we don't. So we're really concerned about the uh, high yield bond market. You can also see that spike in 2009 and some of the during the recession in 2000, 2001. This is another indicator just like the yield curve. So the yield curve has preceded, as I mentioned, an inversion seven times for the recession. Um, yields on high yield bonds usually spike. So when they get to over a thousand or, you know, during the credit crisis, it was extreme. It was about 1800. So basically you were getting 10% to own a, you know, lower quality bond than you were a treasury. That's sort of a sign that things are getting shaken out, and that's been an indication that it's been a good time to buy. But 
until then, it hurts if you're in there and the spreads go higher. Your price declines pretty significantly. So now we got in the market. It has been pretty uh, volatile over the past, you know, 48 to 72 hours. <laughs> and we're actually not too worried about that. We think it is actually, I'd hate, I don't want to say it's a good thing because everyone hates to see the market go up and down as much as it did. It did have an eight point swing from the high this year to the low. But part of the reason, and really the main reason why we think that it actually corrected over the past week or so was it got a little frothy, meaning the valuation was a little bit higher um, than it typically is. So it was trading around 19 times earnings, and you can see that in the green line. So the green line is the S&P 500. You can see how it outpaced the earnings, especially you know over the past couple of years. So everyone was sort of banking in a lot of great news, and the earnings have come out over the past you know quarter, and they have been very good. But you can see this sort of seemed to be a lot of exuberance o over the past year or so. But if you look at all the data that I presented, you look at earnings and you look at credit spreads, meaning the tight, like I mentioned, on the high yield. We think this is just a little blip. We think people were just taking profits. And longer term, that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with the 5 or 6% correction. The market was up about 7% in January alone. That's like a great year many times. So we were expecting more volatility. We weren't expecting the swings that we recently seen. However, if you look at the big picture and CNBC, it, there was a, you know, a flash, the worst day ever. Dow was down 1,500. But when the Dow was at 2,600, that's only you know, a 5% correction or so. When the Dow was at 10,000 and it moved 1,000 points, uh, you know, then there's something to be concerned about. So if you look at the overall picture in the big picture, uh, we think it's very constructive. Um, that we did have this, you know, little blip. It might extend for, you know, a couple days or two, but we're not too worried. We're not going to uh, reposition our portfolios or rebalance. We're comfortable uh, where we're cur currently at. So this is just uh, another version of that chart on the previous one. The S&P 500 prices and earnings, and as I mentioned, you can see that the market was sort of getting a little bit ahead of itself. We do think earnings will catch up, um, so we're not uh, too concerned. And speaking of volatility, uh, this graph is a little bit difficult to read, but the point <laughs> is, if you look at the, fa the past year in 2017, there wasn't much volatility at all. And that's not the norm. It seemed like everyone was complacent. And that was great. The market went up 22% last year, but it's just not realistic. It couldn't really last. We're not, we are not expecting the swings like we just had. That was a little bit extreme, and you can see that on the spike on the right. Uh, but that's just a, a one-off thing. We do expect some volatility, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. So this is one of another, I think, interesting graph that Michael put together. So basically, stock gains after hitting new highs. Just because the stock market's done well and it has hit new highs doesn't mean that you need to sell. It, it, the market can go higher. So the easiest way to look at this, so is one year after stocks hit um, a new high, and one year later, the stocks have been up over, you know, just over 80% of the time. So three years after stocks hit new high, stocks have been up 83% of the time. So when you can look to the second column on the right, the 74.7%. So in months that the stock market hasn't hit a new high, one year later, the stocks are up 74%. So you look to the right, it's the average return. You can see the returns are, you know, a great 13.7, 12.2. Three years is 37 and 39. The point of this slide is that you really need to stay invested. It's, I'm not saying you need to be overweight stocks. You don't need to always be 100% you know, stocks. But we're never going to just you know, sell all the equity holdings. You never, you know, you're never go, we don't time the market. You're never going to get it right. And if you do sell everything, you've got to figure out when to get back in. And what's the chances you get back in at the right time? Probably not that great. So the point is that we do you know, recommend uh, to our clients that they do stay invested. So, and this is um, another uh, graph which sort of illustrates our point. So these are basically the, the cr you know, the crisis uh, over the past six years, going back to the crash in 87, uh, also uh, the Asian contagion, and then you got the dot com crash and the terrorist attacks. Other than, you know, in 2000, and that was, you know, not the norm where the S&P was actually down three straight years. I want to say the S&P uh, has only been down maybe five years, five times in like the past 30 years. So stocks have a tendency to go up. And you can see that. So when things were really in rough shape back in 87, you can see one in three years later, they were up significantly. You can also see that in August of the loan crisis, they were up, 
you know, three and five years later. Like I said, I'll skip the dot-com crash because that was not the norm. But you can see five years later that the stocks were up 54%. And even with the terror attacks in, you know, September 2001, when it feels like the world has changed since then, you can see that after three years, the stock market's been up 41% and then 84% after. So once again, this just goes back to our theme that you need to stay invested. So with that, those are all the slides that, you know, Michael has put together. And now if there's any questions or thoughts, um, that'd be great. Well, can you take in the left seat if you wouldn't mind? And uh, let me just get my glasses here. One second, take a look here. Okay, hello. So, what economic indicators are not moving in the right direction? That's a, that's a good question. <laughs> so, um, well, one of the ones that I did mention is inflation. Uh, we would like to see uh, higher inflation. Um, because that's that means people are spending. Uh, that means you know commodity prices and so forth are going up. Uh, you were just not seeing that. Uh, but if you do look at the data, there really isn't too many um, that aren't. Um, they are. You're seeing expansion through um, you know manufacturing. Like I said, it's basically at full employment at at four uh, percent. You have durable good orders uh, that are uh, doing very well. Uh, you actually are seeing wage growth. So in the big picture, the main uh, data that we are focusing on, uh, a lot of them are just moving in the right direction. Nothing bad to worry about. No, no, yeah. And that maybe could be a little concerning, but things are, things are you know, looking good. So this is with respect to interest rates. What changes might you see with the new Fed chairman now in place? Well, the, the Fed, uh, the new chairman, Powell, he, he basically acknowledged that he is going to be um, sort of stay the path that Janet Yellen has kept. Um, it's basically just be very cautious and, you know, quarter point hikes going forward. He has mentioned that he is, you know, they're on the record for, for three hikes. The one thing that's been interesting, which is actually positive for the markets, is he's a little bit more um, willing to ease uh, the restrictions that the banks have been under uh, during the Yellen policy. And that's, you know, that could be a big boom. That means they can lend more, that means they can invest more, that means they can take a little bit more risk. But um, regarding interest rates and, and Powell, it's, it, it's pretty much the same. There have been a, new, a couple of new Fed governors uh, that are on the board and they're a little bit more hawkish. Um, but as long as Powell is here, we do think they are going to maintain the course. They haven't invested so much, keeping the federal funds rate uh, where it is. We don't expect much, you know, much change this year. Time for two more questions. Okay. So first, uh, is the jobless rate based, based on unemployment claims and what is the rate of those who have exhausted unemployment benefits but uh, simply don't qualify? Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not ex exactly sure. Uh, but regarding the, um, the unemployment rate and so forth, the issue is, like I said, it seems like there's full employment, but there's a big divide in the jobs and wages. So the people who have the skills and you know, are capable of doing you know, higher end jobs, those are, there's a job, a job shortage. Uh, there's, uh, the people working, there's a shortage here. However, the lower quality jobs, there's, there's plenty um, are open, there's really not enough people um, to fill them. But regarding you know, the numbers, the question, which I'm not that much. Thank you. And one last one. Is, if short-term interest rates rise, how does that affect the national debt of the deficit, and does the cost of that deficit go up? Yeah, so there's actually a slide that I did skip over. Maybe I shouldn't have uh, regarded that. And it does show what happens if interest rates rise. Uh, so basically, um, our, what we'll have to pay goes up substantially, and it really is a problem. And that has been another benefit of the Federal Reserve keeping down rates. I want to say maybe we pay about two and a half percent on average on our debt. Maybe it's five hundred million, and I do think it goes up, you know, quite a bit if rates hike. And that is a concern. And what's interesting is that for some reason the Treasury is not borrowing long, meaning with the thirty year at three percent. Uh, the government should probably borrow as much as they can, 30 years, but they're not. They're borrowing on the front end. And I think that sort of shows the extreme of the deficit. And they don't want to increase the payments currently just because they can't afford it. And I hate to say that the government is broke, but, you know, it's about the deficit's 20, 20 so it is a problem. Thank you. Thank you.
There was one question for Harry, though, and I thought it was sort of interesting, so if you can indulge us, Harry. Yeah, so I will, so does Good Samaritan have a robotics program? We do. So we have, um, great question, we do have a robotics program. Uh, we have actually one of the busiest robotic surgeons in the country, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Omar Kudsi, who does a special technique in general surgery that uh, many of his colleagues in the Boston market and, and around the world come and train here. Our chair of the program is uh, Dr. Sohil Hanjani in the OBGYN department. Uh, so it does a lot of urogynecology work. But we have actually the, this was something my predecessor did exceptionally successfully is invest in a technology called the XI. And the XI is a piece of equipment, the latest and greatest of robotics. So we are uh, the only Stewart Hospital that has that technology, and we got that because we have the most productive surgeon, Omar Kudsi, able to use it. So we do have a robust program. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> now, if everybody can just indulge me just for a few more minutes, if you wouldn't mind. So we have coming up a few items for you to learn about. First, our third annual Multicultural Business Forum in After Hours, sponsored by Bridgewater Savings Bank will be held on Thursday, February 22nd at The Perfect Place on Main Street in Brockton. The event is from 5 to 7.30, features a resources expo, a minority woman-owned business panel, and great networking opportunities. This event is free to attend, and you can sign up through the Chamber's website or with Athena this morning. We also ask that you join us for our annual legislative luncheon at noon on Tuesday, March 20th at Bridgewater State University. This year, we will hear from House Speaker Robert DeLeo, as well as an update from Brockton Mayor Bill Carpenter. Tickets and tables can be reserved on the Chamber's website. Lastly, please save the date for the 2018 Taste of Metro South. This event will be held at the Shaw Center on April 24th, so looking forward to seeing all of you there. Now, on to the door prizes and thank yous. Now, first for the door prizes, to make sure that I do this right, so just for a second. So, this month, Lisa DeMello from Banner Environmental, Environmental Services will be featured in the Action Report. <laughs> and if you would please see Emma Stratton before you leave, she can help you out with your publication. Next, the dual prize is our $20 gift certificates to Casa Valhata. Valhata? Hopefully I'm saying that right. Donated by OCS. And the winners are, and they, Cheryl Savage. Brockton VNA. Oh. Yeah, oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. For those of us who have been in Brockton a long time, next to the gas station, <laughs> right across from Chatham West and Pine Estates. Exactly. Mark D'Augustino, D'Augustino Insurance. John Nesty with the Baywood. And Jane Boulay with Trinity Catholic Academy. Yeah. Again. Thank you. Now, I think I have just one more second. So, the thank yous. First, today's ambassador team. So our earlier today, Rob Peters Entertainment, Rich Morgan, Rich Morgan Photography, Brockton Community Access Channel, The Enterprise, most importantly, our sponsors, OCS and Nicole, and Harry Bain and Good Smyrn Medical Center. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> and our interviewer, Richard Hook from Crescent Credit Union, and Tom Hussein, who filled in wonderfully for Michael Tyler. Thank you. Great job. <laughs> and last, we want to thank Good American, yeah, Good, excuse me, Good Samaritan <laughs> Medical Center and Posh Flowers and Gifts with the beautiful centerpieces on your table. The person at each table with the birthday closest to today can take the centerpiece home. Thank you. Have a great day.